There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, a boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Welcome to the summary video for the ethanols and biofuels chapter. In this video, I'm going to give you a quick overview of all the dot points that have been brought up in this chapter. I'll start with the first one, and what you can see is you can always see the number, which refers to the number of the video that this dot point is in. And I'll go over the top one itself. So identify the UAPAC nomenclature for straight chain alkanols from carbon 1 to carbon 8. So what you need to know first, you need to know the different prefixes. These were just the first parts of the name. So we'll go from meth, which is 1 carbon, to oct, which is 8 carbon, everything in between. Then we add whatever. So for example, if we have e, 2 carbons, that's eth. Then we add the an in the middle, so ethane. And because it's an alkanol, that's an alcohol group, we always add the ol. So ethanol. But we also need to know where that OH group is because that uh, changes the way we name something. So for example in this case we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. Five carbons, that's a pent. So um, pent, but we also have the OH group in this case on the third carbon. So we start from the one which is closest to that third carbon. One, two, three. And the other side also one, two, three, so it doesn't matter. So this is pent because that's five. Pentan was at the end and all because of the um, alkanol, so pentanol. And we add the three to show that it's a, the OH group is at the third carbon, pentanol. Another way you can write it is pentan, have the three in the middle, and the all part. So pentan, three all. Same, both the same thing. Now it says we have to know the straight chain ones. And this one is actually still a straight chain. One, two, three, four, five. The fifth one is still in the chain itself even though it looks like it's, it's on the side. Um, so in this case, we have the carbon, the OH group here, is at this carbon. And here we have 1, 2, 3, 4. Here is 1, 2. So this is the closest carbon that we should start counting from. So it's 1, 2, so it's 2 pentanol. One other way you can um, write it is penton 2 ol Now this is actually a not straight one. So here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and another one, which comes off. But if this were coming off here, like I did beforehand, that would be straight, but because this comes off in the middle, this is not straight, and we don't need to name non-straight alkanols. I described the dehydration of ethanol to ethylene and identified the need for a catalyst in this process and the catalyst used. So this is video number two. And in this case, we've got ethanol in the presence of high temperatures and concentrated sulfuric acid goes into ethane plus water. So we've lost the water molecule. And here's again ethanol, the structure of ethanol. We will lose these molecules here for that catalytic reaction, which will again become ethylene, and we lose that water molecule, which was these two mole these two atoms here. Now we need to have concentrated sulfuric acid as our catalyst. And the reason why is because it speeds up a reaction, and this reaction wouldn't go ahead by itself. Also notice the states are all gaseous. That's because we have high temperatures, which means they've just made them all into gas. And the re reverse, describe the addition of water to ethylene, resulting in the production of ethanol, and identify need for a catalyst in this process and the catalyst used. So in this case, we've got ethylene. We add water to it. Our um, catalyst is dilute sulfuric acid, and we also have moderate temperatures of 300 degrees Celsius, and we produce ethanol. So this is here. We have ethylene. We will add this water molecule into structure which is right here, this is the same water molecule, now in the structure. The catalyst is dilute, not sulfuric, but dilute um, sulfuric acid, not concentrated sulfuric acid. And the need for that um, catalyst is because otherwise the reaction wouldn't go ahead. Um, describe and account for the many uses of ethanol as a solvent for polar and nonpolar substances. That was video number four. Now let's describe and account. So describe are there, what kind of uses they have, and account is why do they have these uses. So here we've got an ethanol molecule, here we have an ethane molecule. Um, so first of all, it has two different types of groups. It has this hydroxide group, which is the OH group, and that's this group here. And it also has this hydrocarbon chain, which is just carbons and hydrons, which are all the rest here. And the hydroxide group is polar, and the hydrocarbon group is nonpolar. Compare that to ethane, which only has a nonpolar end. So because we have both a polar and a nonpolar end, we can dissolve things which are both polar and nonpolar. So polar things like sugar or ions or anything else that is water soluble. See so these are the describe the uses as a solvent. It dissolves these things because they are polar and it has a polar end. It also dissolves nonpolar things. 
such as many of our cosmetics, some medicines, and other fat-based. So fat-based are non-polar. All these things are dissolved because it also has a non-polar end. And because of this hydroxide group, it, it's liquid. So obviously, if you want to dissolve something, you have to be liquid, whereas ethane is actually a gas. So ethane can't dissolve anything because it's a gas, whereas ethanol is liquid and has both these two groups, which make it a perfect solvent. And describe conditions under which fermentation of sugar is promoted. We have to have these things present. We have to have a yeast present to convert sugar to ethanol. We have to have aqueous carbohydrates because that's a liquid food for the actual yeast. We have to have temperatures of around 30 degrees, 37 degrees Celsius because that's the optimum temperature for yeast to work at. We need to have anaerobic conditions. That means no oxygen present. We need to have an alcohol-tolerant yeast because that means that yeast can survive high levels of ethanol and can keep fermenting. And it should be somewhat acidic conditions because that helps us to kill off unwanted bacteria. Otherwise, the ethanol can be turned into um, vinegar. Uh, six is, this is video number six. Summarize the chemistry of the fermentation process. <clears throat> we start with starch or maltose. We add water. So this is water. And when we add water to starch or maltose, we can produce two glucose molecules. Those glucose molecules can then be fermented in the presence of a yeast to produce two ethanol and two carbon dioxide. So that's the summary of the chemistry of the fermentation process. And remember, we need to have a yeast present, we need to have plenty of time, our anaerobic conditions, and aqueous starch, and the optimum temperatures. This is number seven. I've, this is just the dehydration and the hydration of ethanol, and I've gone over them in just a couple of uh, minutes ago. So if you want to see the, the actual simulation, computer simulation, watch video seven. I won't go over this old stuff again because I've just gone over it in the last couple of minutes. Eight is process information from secondary sources to summarize the process involved in the industrial production of ethanol from sugarcane. That was video eight. So here we, we start from sugarcane and we want to go to ethanol. So first we have to crush it to produce sucrose juice. From sucrose juice we we extract sucrose. So now it's pure sucrose. All the water has been it's gone or most of the water is gone. From there, we have this sucrose molasse, which is like a syrup. It's a syrupy thing, mostly sucrose, not much water left. We add some acid to kill bacteria. Then it, it's put in the fermentation chamber, where it stays for quite some time. Here, the yeast works on it to produce 10 to 14% ethanol mixtures. The rest of it is water. To get to up to 97% ethanol, we fractionally distillate the actual ethanol. This decreases the water content and increases the ethanol content. Now it's 97%. Then we can dehydrate that remaining water to get to up to 100% ethanol. This is how industry produces ethanol from sugarcane. This was a experiment to so first hand investigation to carry out the fermentation of glucose and monitor mass changes. So what you would have done, you would have had a beaker, you would have had yeast and glucose inside in a hot water bath. You would have first, before you start, you would have also put it on a scale to weigh first, so how much you weighed before you did anything. During the actual experiment, what would have happened is the glucose, which was inside the actual um, beaker or container, was fermented by the yeast, which was also inside, and that produced, for every glucose, produced two ethanols and two carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide, because they're gas, they would have escaped, so you can see these gray dots would have escaped, and the glucose would have started to appear as well, and uh, on the glucose, the ethanol would have started to appear. And then afterwards, we would have reweighed our beaker, and this would have less weight than beforehand. The reason why is because through fermentation, you lost these carbon dioxide molecules. Um, present information to write a balanced equation for the fermentation of glucose to ethanol. So remember, this was our glucose molecule here, C6H12O6, aqueous because it was dissolved in water. And the presence of yeast goes into ethanol, which is this, and carbon dioxide. Now, it needs to be balanced, so we need to check that everything is correct. So here we have six, six oxygen molecules. Here we have two, three on this side. Here we have 12 hydrogens. Here we have six. So it's obviously not balanced. If we add a two in front of here, we have 12 hydrogens on this side, 12 on this side, so everything's balanced. Now we have two oxygens here, two, four on this side, and six on this side. So we want to balance the oxygens. All we have to do is add another two in front of this. Now it's four here, plus two here, six here, and six there, both sides. And now it's completely balanced. So by putting these two in front, we make sure that it's actually balanced. 
then outline the use of ethanol as a solvent, uh, or outline the use of ethanol as a fuel and explain why it can be called a renewable resource. So use of fuel, first we have to harvest it, which is when you use that carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and incorporate it into the corn. After we've harvested, we ferment it to our 10 to 20, 20, 10 to 12% ethanol. Then we use fractional distillation to get even more of it. And then this is the next part, we blend it. So and we actually have our blends, which are in our petrol stations, are only about 10% ethanol and 90% petrol. And that then gets turned into petrol, which is used by our cars. So this is how we kind of use it. And when the cars actually combust the petrol, they release that CO2, which can be reused again. Now it's used a lot in Brazil, quite a bit. The growing usage in ethanol in Australia, but they're mostly these E10 blends, which means only 10% ethanol, whereas most of the blend is not is petrol. And that's the usage of ethanol in, in general, so that's the outline the usage. And then explain why it can be called a renewable resource. We can grow it, so anything that can be grown is, is renewable, we can make it again. And that CO2 that comes from combustion here is then reused to grow the plants, so it's a whole cycle. But it's not complete combustion, uh, not complete CO2 emission free, because when we do ferment, we produce some CO2. When we um, use energy for transport, we release some CO2. So overall, there's some CO2 released, even though CO2 re released compared to petrol is a lot less. Then the, assess the potential of ethanol as an alternative fuel and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of its use. That was video number 12. So the advantages were that it's complete combustion, it was a renewable resource, less CO2 emission than petrol, and it cleans the engine. Uh, the disadvantage, disadvantages was that it was more expensive, had a smaller heat of combustion, uses farmable land, and um, higher than 10 to 15 percent to require engine modifications, and that we had to use water to grow it. Now this is the potential, the assessed pot value of the potential. We need to lower the cost, that's really important, and we need to find alternative sources of ethanol, which don't require farmable land. If we find this, then the usage will increase. More usage will happen if we, if we find this alternative. So this is um, summarize and evaluate the use of success of ethanol as an alternative fuel. And I've chosen the case study of, of Australia, so what happens in Australia. Ethanol production has significantly increased since the 1990s. That's increased, that's the summary part. Government subsidies, government subsidized ethanol production, which means it's cheaper to grow. Ethanol usage as a, as a fuel has increased, so we've been growing more and the actual people have also been using more of it as well in Australia. But ethanol as a fuel is still capped at 10% blend, so most of the blends you get from your petrol station are still only 10% ethanol, the ones that say E10. So that was our summary. Now this is the evaluation part. Australia is a dry continent, which means that we don't have that much water to grow crops. So that's kind of a bad thing. We don't have that much space either. We are running out of farmable space, so we don't have any spare space. We have a 10% cap, which hinders the usage, the amount of it being used, and the cost is also too high. So for us to use more ethanol in Australia, we need to come over, overcome those obstacles. So obstacles have to be overcome if ethanol use is to become a real alternative. So even though at the moment it's being used quite a bit, it's still being used a lot less than petrol. And if we want to use it more, we have to overcome these obstacles. And this one is to find the molar heat of combustion of a compound and calculate the value for ethanol from the first hand data. That was number 14. So what, what molar heat of combustion is, is the energy released if one mole of a substance is combusted in the presence of oxygen. So we need to have enough oxygen present for molar heat of combustion to occur to its fullest. And here I've got two examples. We've got ethanol, which has here oxygen, combust and oxygen, ethanol combust and oxygen, to release carbon dioxide, two molecules, three molecules of water, and this is the energy produced. So 1,367 kilojoules per mole, this is the energy released. Now this is complete combustion, and the way we know that is because it does only produce carbon dioxide. Now this is octane, and in this case we don't have enough oxygen. We would actually need to have about 17 moles of oxygen for complete combustion to occur, but we only have eight and a half. So this octane, which is petrol, will combine with these eight and a half uh, molecules of oxygen to produce not carbon dioxide, but carbon monoxide, eight more moles of this. And this is really, this is toxic, this is poisonous. 
and it will also produce 9 moles of water and it will produce less energy than if it were complete combustion. So you need to know what molar heat of combustion is and also that it only occurs to its fullest extent if you have complete combustion. You need to know the difference between complete and incomplete combustion. I'm not going to calculate because um, it will take too much time for a summary video, but then if you need to know how to calculate, just check out video number 14. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.